Time French. A la recherche du temps perdu first translated into English as remembrance of things past, and sometimes referred to in French as la recherche, the search is a novel in seven volumes by French author Marcel Proust. This early 20th century work is his most prominent, known both for its length and its theme of involuntary memory. The most famous example of this is the episode of the Madeleine, which occurs early in the first volume. The novel gained fame in English in translations by C.K. Scott Mancreef and Terence Kilmartin as Remembrance of Things Past, but the title In Search of Lost Time, a literal rendering of the French, became ascendant after D.J. Enright adopted it for his revised translation published in 1992. About the author Valentin Louis Georges Eugene Marcel Proust Proust French Massel Pust the 10th of July 187118 November 1922 was a French novelist critic and essayist who wrote the monumental novel In Search of Lost Time A la recherche du temps perdu with the previous English title translation of Remembrance of Things Past originally published in French in 7 volumes between 1913 and 1927 He is considered by critics and writers to be one of the most influential authors of the 20th century about the book In Search of Lost Time follows the narrator's recollections of childhood and experiences into adulthood in the late 19th century and early 20th century high society France, while reflecting on the loss of time and lack of meaning in the world. The novel began to take shape in 1909. Proust continued to work on it until his final illness in the autumn of 1922 forced him to break off. Proust established the structure early on, but even after volumes were initially finished, he continued to add new material and edited one volume after another for publication. The last three of the seven volumes contain oversights and fragmentary or unpolished passages, as they existed only in draft form at the death of the author, the publication of these parts was overseen by his brother Robert. The work was published in France between 1913 and 1927. Proust paid for the publication of the first volume by the Grasset Publishing House after it had been turned down by leading editors who had been offered the manuscript in longhand. Many of its ideas, motifs and scenes were anticipated in Proust's unfinished novel Jean Santoy 1896-1899 though the perspective and treatment there are different, and in his unfinished hybrid of philosophical essay and story, Contra saint Beauf 1908-09. The novel had great influence on 20th century literature, some writers have sought to emulate it, others to parody it. For the centenary of the French publication of the novel's first volume, American author Edmund White pronounced In Search of Lost Time, the most respected novel of the 20th century. Summary The novel recounts the experiences of the narrator who is never definitively named while he is growing up, learning about art, participating in society, and falling in love. Volume 1 Swan's Way The narrator begins by noting, For a long time, I went to bed early. He comments on the way in which sleep seems to alter one's surroundings, and the way habit makes one indifferent to them. He remembers being in his room in the family's country home in Cambrai, while downstairs his parents entertain their friend Charles Swan, an elegant man of Jewish origin with strong ties to society. Due to Swan's visit, the narrator is deprived of his mother's goodnight kiss, but he gets her to spend the night reading to him. This memory is the only one he has of Cambrai until. Years later the taste of a Madeleine cake dipped in tea inspires a nostalgic incident of involuntary memory. He remembers having a similar snack as a child with his invalid Aunt Leonie, and it leads to more memories of Cambrai. He describes their servant Francoise, who is uneducated but possesses an earthy wisdom and a strong sense of both duty and tradition. He meets an elegant, lady in pink, while visiting his uncle Adolphe. He develops a love of the theater, especially the actress Burma, and his awkward Jewish friend Bloch introduces him to the works of the writer Bergat. He learns Swan made an unsuitable marriage but has social ambitions for his beautiful daughter Gilbert. Legrandin, a snobbish friend of the family, tries to avoid introducing the boy to his well-to-do sister. The narrator describes two routes for country. Walks the child and his parents often enjoyed, the way past Swan's home, the Meseglise way, and the Germans way, both containing scenes of natural beauty. Taking the Meseglise way, he sees Gilbert Swan standing in her yard with a lady in white, me. Swan, and her supposed lover. Baron de Charles, a friend of Swan's. Gilbert makes a gesture that the narrator interprets as a rude dismissal. 
During another walk, he spies a lesbian scene involving ML. Vintoy, daughter of a composer, and her friend. The Germans' way is symbolic of the Germans' family, the nobility of the area. The narrator is awed by the magic of their name and is captivated when he first sees me. De Germans. He discovers how appearances conceal the true nature of things and tries writing a description of some nearby steeples. Lying in bed, he seems transported back to these places until he awakens. Me. Verderin is an autocratic hostess who, aided by her husband, demands total obedience from the guests in her, little clan. One guest is Odette de Crecy, a former courtesan, who has met Swan and invites him to the group. Swan is too refined for such company, but Odette gradually intrigues him with her unusual style. A sonata by Vintoy, which features a, little phrase, becomes the motif for their deepening relationship. The Verderin's host M. de Forcheville, their guests include Cotard, a doctor, Brichot, an academic, Soniet, the object of scorn, and a painter, M. Bike. Swan grows jealous of Odette, who now keeps him at arm's length, and suspects an affair between her and Forcheville, aided by the Verderans. Swan seeks respite by attending a society concert that includes Legrandin's sister and a young me. De Germans, the, little phrase, is played and Swan realizes Odette's love for him is gone. He tortures himself wondering about her true relationships with others, but his love for her, despite renewals, gradually diminishes. He moves on and marvels that he ever loved a woman who was not his type. At home in Paris, the narrator dreams of visiting Venice or the church in Baalbek, a resort, but he is too unwell and instead takes walks in the Champs-Élysées, where he meets and befriends Gilbert. He holds her father, now married to Odette, in the highest esteem, and is awed by the beautiful sight of me. Swan strolling in public. Years later, the old sights of the area are long gone, and he laments the fleeting nature of places. Volume 2. In the Shadow of Young Girls in Flower. The narrator's parents invite M. de Norpois, a diplomat colleague of the narrator's father, to dinner. With Norpoise's intervention, the narrator is finally allowed to go and see the Burma perform in a play, but is disappointed by her acting. Afterwards, at dinner, he watches Norpois, who is extremely diplomatic and correct at all times, expound on society and art. The narrator gives him a draft of his writing, but Norpois gently indicates it is not good. The narrator continues to go to the Champs-Élysées and play with Gilbert. Her parents distrust him, so he writes to them in protest. He and Gilbert wrestle and he has an orgasm. Gilbert invites him to tea, and he becomes a regular at her house. He observes me, Swan's inferior social status, Swan's lowered standards and indifference towards his wife, and Gilbert's affection for her father. The narrator contemplates how he has attained his wish to know the Swans, and savors their unique style. At one of their parties he meets and befriends Bergat, who gives his impressions of society figures and artists. But the narrator is still unable to start writing seriously. His friend Block takes him to a brothel, where there is a Jewish prostitute named Rachel. He showers me, Swan with flowers, being almost on better terms with her than with Gilbert. One day, he and Gilbert quarrel and he decides never to see her again. However, he continues to visit me. Swan, who has become a popular hostess, with her guests including me, Bon Tom, who has a niece named Albertine. The narrator hopes for a letter from Gilbert repairing their friendship, but gradually feels himself losing interest. He breaks down and plans to reconcile with her, but spies from afar someone resembling her walking with a boy and gives her up for good. He stops visiting her mother also, who is now a celebrated beauty admired by passers-by, and years later he can recall the glamour she displayed then. Teenage girls, particularly one dark-haired beauty who is Albertine Simonette. Elstir arranges an introduction, and the narrator becomes friends with her, as well as her friends Andre, Rosemond, and Giselle. The group goes for picnics and tours the countryside, as well as playing games, while the narrator reflects on the nature of love as he becomes attracted to Albertine. Despite her rejection, they become close, although he still feels attracted to the whole group. At summer's end, the town closes up, and the narrator is left with his image of first seeing the girls walking beside the sea. Volume 3 the Germans' Way The narrator's family has moved to an apartment connected with the Germans' residence. Francoise befriends a fellow tenant, the tailor Jupian and his niece. The narrator is fascinated 
by the garments in their life, and is awed by their social circle while attending another Burma performance. He begins staking out the street where me. De Germans walks every day, to her evident annoyance. He decides to visit her nephew St. Lou at his military base, to ask to be introduced to her. After noting the landscape and his state of mind while sleeping, the narrator meets and attends dinners with St. Lou's fellow officers, where they discuss the Dreyfus affair and the art of military strategy. But the narrator returns home after receiving a call from his aging grandmother. Me, de Germans declines to see him, and he also finds he is still unable to begin writing. St. Lou visits on leave, and they have lunch and attend a recital with his actress mistress, Rachel, the Jewish prostitute, toward whom the unsuspecting St. Lou is crazed with jealousy. The narrator then goes to me. De Villaparisus's salon, which is considered second-rate despite its public reputation. Legrandon attends and displays his social climbing. Bloch stridently interrogates M. de Norpois about the Dreyfus affair, which has ripped all of society asunder, but Norpois diplomatically avoids answering. The narrator observes me. De Germans and her aristocratic bearing, as she makes caustic remarks about friends and family, including the mistresses of her husband, who is M. de Charles's brother. Me, Swan arrives, and the narrator remembers a visit from Morel, the son of his uncle Adolphe's valet, who revealed that the lady in pink was me. Swan, Charles asks the narrator to leave with him, and offers to make him his protege. At home, the narrator's grandmother has worsened, and while walking with him, she suffers a stroke. seeks out the best medical help, and she is often visited by Burgot, himself unwell, but she dies, her face reverting to its youthful appearance. Several months later, Saint Lou, now single, convinces the narrator to ask out the Sturmaria daughter, newly divorced. Albertine visits, she has matured and they share a kiss. The narrator then goes to see me. De Villaparisis, where me? De Germans, whom he has stopped following, invites him to dinner. The narrator daydreams of me. Dister Maria, but she abruptly cancels, although St. Lou rescues him from despair by taking him to dine with his aristocratic friends, who engage in petty gossip. St. Lou passes on an invitation from Charles to come visit him. The next day, at the Germans' dinner party, the narrator admires their Elstir paintings, then meets the cream of society, including the Princess of Parma, who is an amiable simpleton. He learns more about the Germans, their hereditary features, their less refined cousins the Cavassiers, and me. De Germans' celebrated humor, artistic tastes, and exalted diction although she does not live up to the enchantment of her name. The discussion turns to gossip about society, including Charles and his late wife, the affair between Norpois and me. De Villaparisis, and aristocratic lineages. Leaving, the narrator visits Charles, who falsely accuses him of slandering him. The narrator stomps on Charles's hat and storms out, but Charles is strangely unperturbed and gives him a ride home. Months later, the narrator is invited to the Princess de Germans's party. He tries to verify the invitation with M and me. De Germans, but first sees something he will describe later. They will be attending the party but do not help him, and while they are chatting, Swan arrives. Now a committed Dreyfusard, he is very sick and nearing death, but the Germans assure him he will outlive them. Volume 4. Sodom and Gomorrah. Narrator describes what he had seen earlier. While waiting for the Germans to return so he could ask about his invitation, he saw Charles encounter Jupian in their courtyard. The two then went into Jupian's shop and had intercourse. The narrator reflects on the nature of inverts and how they are like a secret society, never able to live in the open. He compares them to flowers, whose reproduction through the aid of insects depends solely on happenstance. Arriving at the princess's party, his invitation seems valid as he is greeted warmly by her. He sees Charles exchanging knowing looks with the diplomat Vagubert, a fellow invert. After several tries, the narrator manages to be introduced to the prince de Germans, who then walks off with Swan, causing speculation on the topic of their conversation. Me, de saint Hubert tries to recruit guests for her party the next day, but is subjected to scorn from some of the Germans. Charles is captivated by the two young sons of M. de Germans's newest mistress. Saint Lou arrives and mentions the names of several promiscuous women to the narrator. Swan takes the narrator aside and reveals the prince wanted to admit his and his wife's pro Dreyfus leanings. Swan is aware of his old friend Charles's behavior, then urges the narrator to visit Gilbert, and departs. 
The narrator leaves with M and me. De Germans, and heads home for a late night meeting with Albertine. He grows frantic when first she is late and then calls to cancel, but he convinces her to come. He writes an indifferent letter to Gilbert, and reviews the changing social scene, which now includes me. Swan Salon centered on Bergat. He decides to return to Baalbek, after learning the women mentioned by St. Lou will be there. At Baalbek, grief at his grandmother's suffering, which was worse than he knew, overwhelms him. He ponders the intermittencies of the heart and the ways of dealing with sad memories. His mother, even sadder, has become more like his grandmother in homage. Albertine is nearby and they begin spending time together, but he starts to suspect her of lesbianism and of lying to him about her activities. He fakes a preference for her friend Andre to make her become more trustworthy, and it works, but he soon suspects her of knowing several scandalous women at the hotel, including Leia, an actress. On the way to visit St. Lou, they meet Morel, the valet's son who is now an excellent violinist, and then the aging Charles, who falsely claims to know. Morel and goes to speak to him. The narrator visits the Verderans, who are renting a house from the Cambremers. On the train with him is the little clan, Brichot, who explains at length the derivation of the local place names, Cotard, now a celebrated doctor, Saniet, still the butt of everyone's ridicule, and a new member, Ski. The Verderans are still haughty and dictatorial toward their guests, who are as pedantic as ever. Charles and Morel arrive together, and Charles's true nature is barely concealed. The Cambremers arrive, and the Verderans barely tolerate them. Back at the hotel, the narrator ruminates on sleep and time, and observes the amusing mannerisms of the staff, who are mostly aware of Charles's proclivities. The narrator and Albertine hire a chauffeur and take rides in the country, leading to observations about new forms of travel as well as country life. The narrator is unaware that the chauffeur and Morel are acquainted, and he reviews Morel's amoral character and plans towards Jupian's niece. The narrator is jealously suspicious of Albertine but grows tired of her. She and the narrator attend evening dinners at the Verderans, taking the train with the other guests. Charles is now a regular, despite his obliviousness to the clan's mockery. He and Morel try to maintain the secret of their relationship, and the narrator recounts a ploy involving a fake duel that Charles used to control Morel. The passing station stops remind the narrator of various people and incidents, including two failed attempts by the Prince de Germans to arrange liaisons with Morel a final break between the Verderans and Cambremers, and a misunderstanding between the narrator, Charles, and Bloch. The narrator has grown weary of the area and prefers others over Albertine, but she reveals to him as they leave the train that she has plans with ML. Vintoy and her friend, the lesbians from Cambrai, which plunges him into despair. He invents a story about a broken engagement of his, to convince her to go to Paris with him, and after hesitating she suddenly agrees to go immediately. The narrator tells his mother, he must marry Albertine. Volume 5. The Prisoner. The narrator is living with Albertine in his family's apartment, to Francoise's distrust and his absent mother's chagrin. He marvels that he has come to possess her, but has grown bored with her. He mostly stays home, but has enlisted Andre to report on Albertine's whereabouts, as his jealousy remains. The narrator gets advice on fashion from me. De Germans, and encounters Charles and Morel visiting Jupian and his niece, who is being married off to Morel. Despite his cruelty towards her. One day, the narrator returns from the Germans and finds Andre just leaving, claiming to dislike the smell of their flowers. Albertine, who is more guarded to avoid provoking his jealousy, is maturing into an intelligent and elegant young lady. The narrator is entranced by her beauty as she sleeps, and is only content when she is not out with others. She mentions wanting to go to the Verderans, but the narrator suspects an ulterior motive and analyzes her conversation for hints. He suggests she go instead to the Trocadero with Andre, and she reluctantly agrees. The narrator compares dreams to wakefulness, and listens to the street vendors with Albertine, then she departs. He remembers trips she took with the chauffeur, then learns Leia the notorious actress will be at the Trocadero too. He sends Francoise to retrieve Albertine, and while waiting, he muses on music and morale. When she returns, they go for a drive, while he pines for Venice and realizes she feels captive. He learns of Burgot's final illness. That evening, he sneaks off to the Verderans to try to discover the reason for Albertine's interest in them. 
he encounters Brichot on the way, and they discuss Swan, who has died. Charles arrives and the narrator reviews the Baron's struggles with Morel, then learns ML. Vintoy and her friend are expected although they do not come. Morel joins in performing a septet by Vintoy, which evokes commonalities with his sonata that only the composer could create. Me. Verderin is furious that Charles has taken control of her party, in revenge the Verderins persuade Morel to repudiate him, and Charles falls temporarily ill from the shock. Returning home, the narrator and Albertine fight about his solo visit to the Verderins, and she denies having affairs with Leia or ML. Vintoy, but admits she lied on occasion to avoid arguments. He threatens to break it off, but they reconcile. He appreciates art and fashion with her, and ponders her mysteriousness. But his suspicion of her and Andre is renewed, and they quarrel. After two awkward days and a restless night, he resolves to end the affair, but in the morning Francoise informs him, Albertine has asked for her boxes and left. Volume 6. The Fugitive The narrator is anguished at Albertine's departure and absence. He dispatches Saint Lou to convince her and me. Bon Tom to send her back, but Albertine insists the narrator should ask, and she will gladly return. The narrator lies and replies he is done with her, but she just agrees with him. He writes to her that he will marry Andre, then hears from Saint Lou of the failure of his mission to the ant. Desperate, he begs Albertine to return, but receives word, she has died in a riding accident. He receives two last letters from her, one wishing him and Andre well, and one asking if she can return. The narrator plunges into suffering amid the many. Different memories of Albertine, intimately linked to all of his everyday sensations. He recalls a suspicious incident she told him of at Balbek, and asks Aimee, the headwriter, to investigate. He recalls their history together and his regrets, as well as love's randomness. Aimee reports back, Albertine often engaged in affairs with girls at Balbek. The narrator sends him to learn more, and he reports other liaisons with girls. The narrator wishes he could have known the true Albertine, whom he would have accepted. He begins to grow accustomed to the idea of her death, despite constant reminders that renew his grief. Andre admits her own lesbianism but denies being with Albertine. The narrator knows he will forget Albertine, just as he has forgotten Gilbert. He happens to meet Gilbert again, her mother me. Swan became me. De Forcheval and Gilbert is now part of high society, received by the Germans. The narrator publishes an article in Le Figaro. Andre visits him and confesses her relations with Albertine. She also explains the truth behind Albertine's departure. Her aunt wanted her to marry another man. The narrator and his mother visit Venice, which enthralls him. They happen to see Norpois and me. De Villa Paris is there. A telegram signed from Albertine arrives, but the narrator is indifferent. Returning home, the narrator and his mother receive surprising news. Gilbert will marry Saint Lou, and Jupian's niece will be adopted by Charles and then married to Legrandin's nephew, an invert. There is much discussion of these marriages among society. The narrator visits Gilbert in her new home where he also realizes that the telegram was from her, not Albertine, who is not alive, and is shocked to learn of Saint Lou's affair with Morel, among others. He despairs for their friendship. Volume 7. Time Regained. The narrator is staying with Gilbert at her home near Cambrai. They go for walks, on one of which he is stunned to learn the Meseglise way and the Germans way are actually linked. Gilbert also tells him she was attracted to him when young, and had made a suggestive gesture to him as he watched her. Also, it was Leia she was walking with the evening he had planned to reconcile with her. He considers St. Lou's nature and reads an account of the Verderin Salon, deciding he has no talent for writing. The scene shifts to a night in 1916, during World War I, when the narrator has returned to Paris. From a stay in a sanatorium and is walking the streets during a blackout. He reflects on the changed norms of art and society, with the Verderans now highly esteemed. He recounts a 1914 visit from Saint Lou, who was trying to enlist secretly. He recalls descriptions of the fighting he subsequently received from Saint Lou and Gilbert, whose home was threatened. He describes a call paid on him a few days previously by St. Lou, they discussed military strategy. Now on the dark street, the narrator encounters Charles, who has completely surrendered to his impulses.
Charles reviews Morel's betrayals and his own temptation to seek vengeance, critiques Brichot's new fame as a writer, which has ostracized him from the Verderans, and admits his general sympathy with Germany. The last part of the conversation draws a crowd of suspicious onlookers. After parting the narrator seeks refuge in what appears to be a hotel, where he sees someone who looks familiar leaving. Inside, he discovers it to be a male brothel, and spies Charles using the services. The proprietor turns out to be Jupian, who expresses a perverse pride in his business. A few days later, news comes that St. Lou has been killed in combat. The narrator pieces together that St. Lou had visited Jupian's brothel, and ponders what might have been had he lived. Years later, again in Paris, the narrator goes to a party at the house of the Prince de Germans. On the way he sees Charles, now a mere shell of his former self, being helped by Jupian. The paving stones at the Germans' house inspire another incident of involuntary memory for the narrator, quickly followed by two more. Inside, while waiting in the library, he discerns their meaning. By putting him in contact with both the past and present, the impressions allow him to gain a vantage point outside time, affording a glimpse of the true nature of things. He realizes his whole life has prepared him for the mission of describing events as fully revealed, and finally resolves to begin writing. Entering the party, he is shocked at the disguises old age has given to the people he knew, and at the changes in society. Brandon is now an invert, but is no longer a snob. Block is a respected writer and vital figure in society. Morel has reformed and become a respected citizen. Me, de Forcheville is the mistress of M. de Germans. Me, Verderin has married the Prince de Germans after both their spouses died. Rachel is the star of the party, abetted by me. De Germans, whose social position has been eroded by her affinity for theater. Gilbert introduces her daughter to the narrator, he is struck by the way the daughter encapsulates both the Messeglise and Germans' ways within herself. He is spurred to writing, with help from Francoise and despite signs of approaching death. He realizes that every person carries within them the accumulated baggage of their past, and concludes that to be accurate he must describe how everyone occupies an immense range, in time. Paula Recherche made a decisive break with the 19th century realist and plot driven novel, populated by people of action and people representing social and cultural groups or morals. Although parts of the novel could be read as an exploration of snobbery, deceit, jealousy, and suffering, and although it contains a multitude of realistic details, the focus is not on the development of a tight plot or of a coherent evolution but on a multiplicity of perspectives and on the formation of experience. The protagonists of the first volume, The Narrator is a Boy and Swan, are, by the standards of 19th century novels, remarkably introspective and passive, nor do they trigger action from other leading characters. To contemporary readers, reared on Honoré de Balzac, Victor Hugo and Leo Tolstoy, they would not function as centers of a plot. While there is an array of symbolism in the work, it is rarely defined through explicit, keys, leading to moral, romantic or philosophical ideas. The significance of what is happening is often placed within the memory or in the inner contemplation of what is described. This focus on the relationship between experience, memory and writing and the radical de-emphasizing of the outward plot, have become staples of the modern novel but were almost unheard of in 1913. Roger Shattuck elucidates an underlying principle in understanding Proust and the various themes present in his novel. Thus the novel embodies and manifests the principle of intermittence, to live means to perceive different and often conflicting aspects of reality. This iridescence never resolves itself completely into a unitive point of view. Accordingly, it is possible to project out of the search itself a series of putative and intermittent authors. The portraitist of an expiring society, the artist of romantic reminiscence, the narrator of the laminated, I, the classicist of formal structure, all these figures are to be found in Proust.